Tonight, a promise kept. A new era of religious revival begins in India as Prime Minister Narendra Modi opens the nation's biggest Hindu temple in a ceremony that embodies the triumphs of his politics and is seen as an unofficial start to his re-election campaign this year. DeSantis departs. Florida governor, once celebrated as the possible contender against Donald Trump, wraps up his presidential campaign efforts after failing to make traction puts his weight behind Donald Trump, which seems to seal the deal for the former president. Failed targets Japan's economic forecast towards balancing their budget seems to fail as the world's fifth largest economy takes early hit with a possible recession in the West. And the watch mistake. The watch that was confiscated rakes in hundreds of thousands of dollars. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us on this Monday night. We have a lot of stories uh, across the globe to bring to you. Uh, the conflict in Israel and Ukraine continues to see escalations, and China um, suffered some lethal landslide. But before any of that, we want to start uh, in neighboring India where Prime Minister Narendra Modi led the consecration today of a grand temple to the Hindu god Lord Ram on a site believed to be his birthplace. Uh, in a historic event for the Hindu majority of the world's uh, most populous nation, delivering on a crucial Hindu nationalistic pledge that his governing party hopes will catapult him to a record third successive term in upcoming general elections. Portrayed as a Hindu awakening from centuries of subjugation by Muslim and colonial powers, the event is also being seen as a crucial element in the prelude to Modi's campaign for a rare third term in general elections due by May. The state of Uttar Pradesh, where Ayodhya is located, has declared Monday a public holiday. All schools in the country's largest state are shut and liquor shops will be closed according to a circular issued by Uttar Pradesh's government. Public schools in the national capital Delhi are shut and government office workers have been given a half day. Indian news channels have devoted a tremendous amount of time to cover every detail about the Ram Temple, from counting the number of sweets that are being made in celebration to documenting all the religious events that have preceded its inauguration. The Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh State, where Ayodhya is located, has called the Ram Mandir India's national temple and one that celebrates the country's pride. The Israel-Palestinian conflict saw a grim milestone past as the Gazan casualties were recorded to surpass 25,000. And as our artillery rained down on the West Bank, global leaders like UN's uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Gutierrez continued to condemn Israel's relentless pursuit. Israel's Netanyahu has said he rejects any deals with Hamas for the release of captives that would end the war, despite calls from Israeli politicians. Gaza's health ministry says that 178 Palestinians were killed and 293 injured in the past 24 hours with attacks nearing Khan Yunis' vital Nasser Hospital. Israel government approved the deal for frozen tax funds for the occupied West Bank and Gaza to be held in Norway, instead of being transferred to the Palestinian Authority. The latter rejects any conditions placed on its receipt of the tax revenue. Over 25,000 people have now been killed and 62,681 wounded in Israeli attacks on Gaza since October 7th. The death toll in Israel from October 7th Hamas attacks stands at 1,139. Israeli military tanks were seen moving among buildings in Khan Yunis as military operations intensified in the southern Gaza city. Israeli planes resumed heavy bombing on Khan Yunis in the south of the Gaza Strip and explosions echoed throughout the city. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres denounced Israel for the heartbreaking deaths of Palestinian civilians in Gaza and called it unacceptable to resist statehood for the Palestinian people. Speaking at the opening of a summit of the G77 plus China in the Ugandan capital Kampala, Guterres added that the refusal to accept the two-state solution for Israelis and Palestinians is totally unacceptable, saying denying Palestinians the right to statehood would indefinitely prolong a conflict that has become a major threat to global peace and security. In another war, 
Ukraine's uh, Russian-occupied region of Donetsk saw calamity as a long-ranging attack from what the Russian forces alleged are Ukrainian artillery caused over 20 casualties. It should be noted, however, that Ukraine has not yet made any official remarks on the attack. A Ukrainian artillery strike on the Russian-controlled city of Donetsk in eastern Ukraine left at least 27 dead on Sunday. That's according to the Russian-appointed head of the region who said 25 people were also injured. The city's Russian-installed mayor said Ukrainian forces bombarded a busy area with shops and a market. This man said he got a call on his wife's phone, alerting him that she had died. He says she traded here. There was no immediate Ukrainian comment on the shelling. Russia called the attack a, quote, barbaric act of terrorism. It has been almost two years since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Its own campaign of airstrikes and heavy shelling has killed thousands of Ukrainian civilians. Donetsk is one of four regions in Ukraine's east and south that Moscow claimed to have annexed in 2022. The move was condemned as illegal by most countries at the UN General Assembly. Russia does not have full control over any of the regions. Over to China now, a spate of ill-fated weather conditions caused calamity in China as a landslide in southwestern mountainous Yunnan province buried close to 50 people, killing multiple and uh, forcing the evacuation of more than 200 families uh, amidst freezing temperatures and uh, falling snow. Recovery efforts are still underway with many holding on to hope that they will be able to reunite with those still trapped under the rubble. A landslide in southwestern China's mountainous Yunnan province early today buried 47 people, killing at least two and forced the evacuation of 200 more amid freezing temperatures and falling snow. The disaster struck just before 6 a.m. in the village of Liangshui in the northeastern part of Yunnan province. Rescue efforts were underway to find victims buried in 18 separate houses. Two bodies were pulled from the rubble. The cause of the landslide wasn't immediately known, as survivors and rescuers struggled with snow and freezing temperatures that were forecast to persist for at least the next three days. Last week, rescuers evacuated tourists from a remote skiing area in the northwestern China, where dozens of avalanches triggered by heavy snow had trapped more than 1,000 people for a week. The avalanches blocked roads, stranding both tourists and residents in a village in Altai Prefecture in Xinjiang region close to China's border with Mongolia, Russia and Kazakhstan. Landslides, often caused by rain or unsafe construction work, are not uncommon in China. At least 70 people were killed in landslides last year, including more than 50 at an open pit mine in China's Inner Mongolia region. The weather continues to be an area of concern for many nations across the globe. It seems uh, as the UK ha as well has put out flood alerts, among other uh, meteorological warnings, as storms, uh, Storm Isha breaks havoc across uh, the greater parts of the nation, including Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as Wales. Thousands of people across Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Northwest England have spent the night without power after Storm Isha battered the UK with strong winds and heavy rain. Gusts of 99 miles per hour were recorded in Northumberland and travel disruption is set to continue into this week. Uprooted trees are blocking roads and many trains have been cancelled. A Met Office yellow warning for wind remains across the UK with gusts of 50 to 60 miles per hour forecast inland. The Met Office said damage to homes and buildings, falling trees, power cuts and flying debris should be expected, adding that in exposed coastal stretches, gusts could reach 70 to 80 miles per hour. The highest gust so far recorded was 99 miles per hour at Brisley Wood in Northumberland. The wind meant hundreds of flights were cancelled across the UK and some who did make it into the air didn't land in at their intended destination. The Met Office has said the heavy rain could lead to flooding this week. The Environmental Agency in England has issued 30 flood warnings where flooding is expected and 96 flood alerts where flooding is possible. There are 50 flood warnings in place in Scotland and six in Wales. After days of freezing temperatures and snow in some parts of the UK, higher temperatures are expected this week, but the Met Office has warned it may not feel warmer due to high winds. 
The latest on the US presidential election coming right after this short commercial break. You're watching World News Tonight with Mirabha. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now in the latest on the US presidential election, it looks like uh, it's a done deal for former President uh, Donald J. Trump. Uh, this is after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in a move that came as a surprise to many. He laid down his campaigning year and took his side beside former President Trump. Well, other than a World News special correspondent, uh, Suzanne Shinali reports from Toronto. Mahesh, it comes as a shock to many when Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who entered the Republican presidential primary as Donald Trump's greatest threat, announced that he is ending his White House bid and endorsing the former president. His announcement, made in a video posted on X, comes after a disappointment second place finish in last week's Iowa Republican caucuses. He then touted his support for Trump, stating that while he's had disagreements with Donald Trump, it is clear that he is superior to the current incumbent Joe Biden. His departure leaves former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as the lone Trump alternative in the race but without much time to consolidate support and catch up to the front runner. DeSantis's decision came after days of conversation with donors. It became clear over the weekend that there was neither the rational nor the financial support to continue his candidacy. Now over the past many months, Casey and I have traveled across the country to deliver a message of hope that decline is a choice and that we can in fact succeed again as a nation. Nobody worked harder and we left it all out on the field. Now following our second place finish in Iowa, we've prayed and deliberated on the way forward. If there was anything I could do to produce a favorable outcome, more campaign stops, more interviews, I would do it. But I can't ask our supporters to volunteer their time and donate their resources if we don't have a clear path to victory. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. DeSantis told the donors that there was no reason to waste his time and money staying in the race. DeSantis said that there was no path to victory with Trump in the running. Now with the New Hampshire primary in Bloomberg, it remains to be seen how exactly this upset will translate into the current political landscape. Will it be smooth sailing to finish for Trump or will Haley get a leg up in the race? We'll have to wait and see much. Indeed, other than a World News special correspondent, Susan Shinali, they're reporting uh, from Toronto, Canada. Thank you. Now, the New Hampshire primaries are just around the corner, and it seems Republican voters are gearing up to make the most contrasting decision of their political lives. Without DeSantis uh, out of the running, how will Nikki Haley fare? Will she uh, emerge a victor in a major upset, or will it be as expected with a sweeping victory for Donald Trump? The race for the Republican and Democratic presidential nominations will converge in New Hampshire in the first primary election of the season, though on the Democratic side, the contest may count only for bragging rights. The Republican primary will test former President Donald Trump's front-runner status in a state he carried by a comfortable margin in the 2016 primary, but as a considerably more moderate electorate than the one that delivered him a big win in the Iowa caucuses. It will also be a test for former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who wants to establish herself as the main alternative to Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who edged Haley for a second place in Iowa, suspended his campaign and endorsed Trump. Trump has had a consistent lead in the polls, with Haley, a former South Carolina governor, appearing to be in the strongest position among his rivals. There is an added variable now as it's being reported that the weather has caused 92 confirmed fatalities linked to the past week's winter crunch. Dangerous weather continued across the U.S. Tens of millions of people were facing bitterly cold, below average temperatures, and the eastern half of the country will likely experience some of the coldest weather yet this season with dangerous wind chills and hard freeze warnings extending into northern Florida.
Let's take you to Japan now. Japan is in some uh, hot water as the world's uh, fifth largest economy is said to miss its long-standing goal of balancing its primary budget uh, in the fiscal year of 2025. This is according to the government's own forecast. Uh, let's get the latest on that story. And for that, let's cross over to Tokyo, Japan. Standing by is Andhra Naval News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa with the latest on it. Rasita. Hi, Mahesh. Ever since Prime Minister Kishida announced his huge stimulant package, which runs around 20 trillion Japanese yen last November, people are wondering what would be the impact for the Japanese economy and for his health. It's not because Japan cannot afford the 20 trillion because they, we had these insane huge relief packages during COVID. It's because Japan itself has some issues, especially with the debt, which runs more than twice of their GDP. And also it has a low growth in their GDP, which is which growth like the real GDP, just 1.5%. So people are asking questions about what this would actually mean and why this is happening. This 20 trillion includes 3.5 trillion yen tax cuts. So which is uh, unheard in recent Japan, uh, uh, especially like past 20 years. And they are also giving 1 trillion yen cash handouts for the needed people, which is also a huge number. Plus they are spending few more trillions and they are also spending uh, one trillion for the, to support the uh, the New Year's earthquake, which happened in the Notohanto. So these are all huge numbers. It's not that Japan cannot afford this because Japan collected 71 trillion uh, as taxes last year, and which is the highest, which was the highest in their, re in their history. But the problem is they also spent a lot. They spent 84 trillion, so that means there was a 13 trillion deficit. So the Japanese primary balance, the what you earn and what you spend, stand like 13 trillion last year, and which was about 3% of GDP, we call it minus 3%. And Japan had not had a, a plus, a surplus, ever since their bubble days in 1990s. So that means the government need to print money or either issue debt. But here they don't print that money, so the only thing is issuing debt. Which is people, which is for other people, like sounds like a not a smart solution. But for Japanese government, the debt is the key because the Japanese debt runs, the interest rates are so low, like the two, three years Japanese uh, JGB, what we call the bonds running like in minus interest rate. So issuing debt is never an issue for them. So uh, the Japanese government having issued this, having announced these uh, stimulants, they still have to cope with some other issues like the defense, increased defense bills, aging populations, supporting childcare. Even though the government uh, did not address these issues in the last budget, they cannot f overlook this for a long time. The next big biggest issue is the Bank of Japan economic policies, because unlike its peers, the Bank of Japan kept the interest rate in 0%. The, one of the biggest issues for that is, unlike other countries, inflation is not a huge issue here. Even though the Japanese government and the Bank of Japan expect in, expected inflation to go around 2%, uh, the real inflation was about less than 1%. So expect the policy to stay around same, uh, at least for the second, third quarter of the 2024, because the uh, economics see no reason for the Japanese uh, Bank of Japan to increase that. So with the huge stimulants coming over, rolling out this year, and the Bank of Japan is keeping the uh, interest rate zero, and Japan is a country deep into Keynesian policies, we do not expect drastic changes in their economic policies. Over to you, Mahesh. Absolutely. Well, we'll we, ha we have to wait and see uh, as to what uh, happens on that. Rasita Chandradasa, the Renault World News Special Correspondent, reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Thank you. Well, Boeing continues to come under question with yet another model being inspected for potential safety lapses due to using the same dough mechanism as the 737 MAX 9s. This is after bolt issue caused uncertainty in the integrity of the company's entire fleet. More trouble for Boeing after U.S. watchdogs warned airlines late Sunday to check for loose parts on another model. The recommendation comes after some operators of the 737-900ER reported unspecified issues with bolts during inspections. It has the same optional door plug design as the newer 737 MAX 9, the model used by Alaska Airlines when it suffered a mid-air blowout earlier this month.
That led to the Federal Aviation Administration grounding 171 MAX 9 planes for safety checks. In an alert about the 737-900ER, the FAA said some airlines, quote, noted findings with bolts during additional maintenance checks. It recommended air carriers operating that model inspect their planes, specifically the four bolts used to secure the door plug to the airframe, as soon as possible. However, it added that the door plug has not been an issue with this model. A Boeing spokesperson said in an email, quote, We fully support the FAA and our customers in this action. Boeing first delivered the 737-900ER in 2007 and the last one in 2019. As for the MAX 9, the FAA said on Sunday the jets will remain grounded until it, quote, is satisfied they are safe to return to service. Let's take a short commercial break. Mobile news right after this. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Well, we are inching closer to an era of urban air mobility as test flights of South Korea's new urban air mobility vehicles are scheduled to take off in the greater metropolitan region of the nation starting this summer. The UAM named OPATH, developed with technology by the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, has successfully completed a test flight. Until now, UAM test flights have taken place in non-urban areas, such as the reclaimed land in Kohung, Jeollanamdo province. However, starting this year, test flights will also be conducted in metropolitan areas. From August, the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport will begin the second stage of the demonstration plan of connecting suburban and urban areas in the capital region, starting near the Ara Waterway in Incheon's Kaeyang district. By 2025, the testing stage will expand to skies over the Han River, connecting Yeoido, Kintex and Koyang and Kimpo Airport, and further linking Tamsil and Suso via Tancheon. This year, UAMs ambitiously developed by South Korean corporate consortia will also take to the skies for refinement. South Korea has entered a competition for demonstration projects with other major countries such as the United States, France and the United Kingdom. Not only the UAMs, but also all the services necessary for actual operations such as vertiports and traffic management are now being looked into. Following this, the Korea Augmentation Satellite System, or CAS, which reduces location error significantly compared to GPS signals, is expected to contribute to achieving the goal of UAM commercialization in 2026. Well, I'm sure we all have heard uh, of the saying, Dogs are a man's best friend. I don't know why it exists, but it, it is there. Well, now we see it in action. A Michigan man who fell into an ice-covered lake can thank his dog, Ruby, for helping uh, to rescue him. Michigan State Police Officer uh, Cameron uh, Bennett's video shows uh, the officer arriving at the Arbiter's Lake and calling Ruby over and attaching an orange rescue disc that resembles a, freeze, a frisbee to her collar. Ruby then ran across the ice to bring it to her owner. The 65-year-old man grabbed hold of the disc and Bennett, uh, along with a firefighter, were able to pull him in. Police were called to the scene by uh, bystanders who saw him fall. Well, you remember last week we told you about the story where Arnold Schwarzenegger, the actor, action actor, had to basically leave his watch after bringing it illegally to Germany? Well, that luxury watch was sold at an auction for almost $300,000. That's nearly triple its estimated value. Arnold Schwarzenegger's now famous watch just sold at auction for almost $300,000, nearly triple its estimated value. The action star and former governor was detained at the airport in Munich, Germany for supposedly failing to declare the ritzy watch at customs. Poking fun at his recent travel troubles, Arnold Schwarzenegger was released after three hours. That watch's uh, value went up so much because it was in the hand of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Go figure. 
Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back again at the same time tomorrow with another edition. See you then.